This video is the fourth video in a series on masking. The first two videos covered whether or not masking is needed for air and bone conduction testing. In the last video, we talked about how to mask air conduction signals. We're sticking with the same hearing profile from the first three videos, so be sure to check those out if you haven't already. In this video, we're going over how to effectively mask when you find your bone conduction thresholds. First, let's talk about unmasked bone conduction. A part of the energy from the bone conduction signal vibrates the ear canal and creates a sound in the ear canal. A lot of that sound escapes out of the ear canal, but some of it goes back down through the ossicles and stimulates the cochlea. Now let's remember what's going on when we mask bone conduction on a real patient. We have a headband vibrating stimulator that's usually placed on the test ear mastoid, and then we have a headphone or insert earphone that plugs up the non-test ear. So we have one ear that is occluded or plugged up because it's covered. Bone conduction signals seem louder when there's occlusion involved. If you don't believe me, say ah and cover up and uncover one of your ears with your palm while you say it. The sound seems to get louder in the ear that you cover up. When your ear canal vibrates in response to a bone conduction signal and that canal is blocked by an earphone, the sound energy can't escape like it normally does. Instead, the sound hits the earphone and reflects back down the ear canal, down the auditory chain until it reaches the cochlea. This is called the occlusion effect. Whenever one ear is plugged up and you're hearing something by bone conduction, some of those frequencies are getting a big boost. Not all frequencies are affected equally. Lower frequencies get the biggest boost, while high frequencies often don't show the occlusion effect at all. With all of this background in mind, let's jump into the simulation. Looking at 500 Hertz, we decided that bone conduction masking wasn't needed because it doesn't really change anything about our diagnosis if the response given came from the left or the right ear. Remember that procedures and opinions can vary here, so be sure to check what's expected of you by your instructor. At 1000 Hertz, we decided masking was needed because we have an air bone gap of greater than 10 dB, which means without masking, we aren't sure if the left ear has a conductive hearing issue or not. What level should we start masking at? This philosophy is very similar to air conduction masking. We want to cover up the non-test ear and we're using an air conduction signal in that ear. So let's turn on masking at the air conduction threshold of the non-test ear and add a 10 dB safety pad just to be safe. This should be enough, right? But there's one problem. The non-test ear is covered by an earphone and so we have the occlusion effect in that ear. That bone conduction signal sounds louder in the non-test ear because sound isn't allowed to escape the ear canal. It's reflecting off the earphone playing our masking sound and it's going back down the chain into the cochlea. So we need to account for this in our initial masking level calculation. There are lots of recommended amounts to add to account for the occlusion effect. And for this video, we're assuming that there's a 10 dB occlusion effect at 1000 Hertz. So we'll raise our masker level an extra 10 dB to make sure we're covering up the boosted signal in the non-test ear. We present and we get no response. So we know now that the unmasked bone conduction response we got actually came from the right ear. We raise the level of the stimulus until we get a response again. Now, did this response come from the test or the non-test ear? Well, let's raise the masker a few times to make sure that adding more noise to the test ear doesn't change our response. Once you find your 15 to 20 dB plateau we discussed in the last video, you can save your threshold and feel confident that the non-test ear wasn't involved. Let's do this process a little bit more quickly at 2000 Hertz. We'll start at the air conduction threshold of the non-test ear and add a 10 dB safety pad. At higher frequencies, there isn't a significant occlusion effect, so we don't have to add anything extra here. We just raise the level of our stimulus until we get a response, and then we raise the masker. We go back and forth doing this, raising the stimulus and then the masker until we continue to get a response, even when we raise the masker three to four times for a 15 to 20 dB plateau. Here we can save the threshold and feel confident that we got responses from the correct ears on our audiogram. To wrap things up, we do the same procedure at 4000 Hertz. We'll put our masking in at the unmasked air conduction threshold in the non-test ear, and we'll add a 10 dB safety pad. 
then we'll present our stimulus and raise the level of the stimulus until we get a response. When we find a response, we'll raise the masker, then raise the stimulus, raise the masker, raise the stimulus, raise the masker, raise the stimulus, and continue this until we find a level where this uh, where the stimulus response doesn't change after three or four increases to the masker level. Now we've completed our audiogram with air and bone conduction masking. That's it for this video. If you want to keep learning about masking, look out for other videos in a different series or post in the comments a video that you'd like to see to help you understand masking a little bit better. Check out these other videos that we've got, like this video, and hit subscribe so I can keep bringing you good content. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.